Hi, I'm Kayla Martin Gant. I am the Continuing Education Coordinator for the Mississippi Library Commission. And today I'm going to be presenting Read with Pride, which is uh, LGBTQ plus reads and programming ideas. I'm going to be showing you some books for all different ages. Uh, so let's get started. First, this is just a little introduction to me. Um, again, I'm Kayla Martin Gant. I'm the CE coordinator for the Mississippi Library Commission. And I'm also a former teen librarian, a uh, reference and genealogy librarian. Um, I'm thankful I wasn't all of those things at one time exactly. So first I'm gonna go through uh, some picture books. So first we're going to talk about What Are Your Words, a book about pronouns. This is by Catherine Locke and it's illustrated by Anne Pashir. Um, so whenever Ari's uncle Lior comes to visit, they ask Ari one question, what are your words? Uh, some days Ari uses she, her, other days Ari uses he, him. But on the day of the neighborhood's big summer bash, Ari doesn't know what words to use. Um, so this is just like a really nice, um, it's a really nice little picture book. It's got bright graphic illustrations uh, and it's a simple story, but it makes a great introduction for uh, especially your really early readers to uh, get familiar with some more gender inclusive pronouns that they may be seeing out there in the world. Um, and uh, it shows you that it's okay to not know right away uh, what you wanna use or what you feel comfortable with. Um, this one's coming out in May, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, next we have Sparkle Boy, um, which is so cute, y'all. So uh, Casey loves to play with his blocks, puzzles, and dump truck, but he also loves things that sparkle, shimmer, and glitter. And when his older sister, Jessie, shows off her shimmery new skirt, Casey wants to wear a shimmery skirt too. Um, the adults in Casey's life uh, in this book, they're they're pretty great. They they don't ever seem to, you know, have a, a hard time um, with Casey and his interests. Um, and his older sister, though, like she she isn't so sure because boys aren't supposed to like all the glittery happy stuff, right? Um, but then Casey starts getting teased, and uh, Jesse realizes that Casey can be himself and do whatever he wants and wear whatever he wants. Um, and this is by Leslie Newman, uh, and the illustrator is Maria Mola. It's a really sweet, heartwarming little story about respect and acceptance and um, the freedom to be yourself. And also that sparkly things are fun and should be enjoyed by everybody. Then we have Prince and Knight, which uh, is adorable, as you can tell from these illustrations. Uh, this is by Daniel Hawk, and the illustrator is Stevia Lewis. So once upon a time in a kingdom far from here, there was a prince in line to take the throne. So his parents set out to find him a kind and worthy bride. And they travel and they look for princesses they meet. And they're, none of them are just really, they're, they're not really clicking. Um, and then while they're away, this great and terrible dragon threatens the land and all of the soldiers flee. And the prince rushes back to save his kingdom and is met by a brave knight um, and they fight the dragon and then they fall in love. And it's extremely cute. Cannot stress enough how cute this story is. Um, some of you like are probably pretty familiar with this one, but did you know there is another book that goes along with it called Maiden and Princess? Um, it's also by Daniel Hawk, uh, but it's also by Isabel Galupo. And the illustrator for this one is Becca Human. Um, and this one came out in 2019. Um, so once again, in a faraway kingdom, there's a strong, brave maiden who is invited to attend the prince's royal ball. Um, she's not exactly stoked to go. And after her mother convinces her that she has to go, she has to make an appearance, she ends up really leaving imp an impression on everyone uh, from the villagers to the king and queen. And uh, she ends up finding true love uh, in a most surprising place. Um, these are just some really cute, like sweet little fairy tale uh, type stories. And that seems to, uh, at first glance, kind of like an easy route to take, but there is something so wholesome about seeing the kinds of fairy tales, you know, that, that you grow up with and um, that all of us here, you know, all the time when we're kids, be more inclusive um, of all the different people out there who deserve to have their own fairy tales too. Um, and last for the picture books, we have Jack, not Jackie. 
This is by Erica Silverman and the illustrator is Holly Haddam. So Susan thinks her little sister Jackie is like so funny and she has the cutest giggle and she can't wait for Jackie to get older because then they can do all sorts of stuff. They can play forest fairies and they can explore together. Um, but Jackie starts to grow up and she doesn't want to play those games. Um, she wants to play in the mud and be like a super bug. And she also doesn't like dresses and she would rather be called Jack. Um, this is a story, you know, essentially about a young trans kid. And uh, I've spoken to people who are a little taken aback sometimes when it comes to uh, having picture books featuring transgender children. Um, but the thing is, there are lots of people, you know, that that don't know that about themselves until they're they're much, much older. But there are a lot of people that know, I mean, when they're tiny, tiny kids. And that's okay. And it's good to have picture books that show that, not just for um not just for other people, you know, reading it, but for those kids who may be realizing something about themselves, but they can't quite articulate it, um, to find that acceptance, you know, even just in a picture book, um, that, that is a really useful emotional tool for them, um, as well as, you know, for parents and teachers and other kids. So now we're going to move on to some middle grade books. First, we have Anna on the Edge by AJ Sass. This came out in 2020, and I heard so much about it, uh, and then I got to read it, and I was not disappointed. Um, this is a uh, 12-year-old Anna Marie Jin is the reigning U.S. juvenile figure skating champion. Not really a frilly dress kind of kid, not into all the frou-frou princess stuff, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just not really Anna's thing. So um, it turns out next season's uh, figure skating program is going to be princess themed, and Anna is not stoked about that. And then Anna meets Hayden, who is a transgender boy who's new to the rink, new to the whole ice skating thing, um, and Anna suddenly starts thinking about... Um, a lot of things like gender identity along with the princess program and trying to kind of come to grips with all of that. And then Hayden mistakes Anna for a boy and Anna doesn't really correct him and then sort of finds comfort in this boyish identity. Um, and so it's a, it's a really sweet, heartwarming story about this kid who is just trying to be a person in the world um, and figure out who they are and what that means exactly. Then we have Rick by Alex Gino. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Alex Gino uh, who wrote George, which is not only um, an award-winning book, but also one of the most banned books of the last few years. Um, so uh, Rick has never really questioned much. He's kind of gone along with his best friend, Jeff, even when Jeff was being a jerk. Um, and he lets his dad joke around with him about hot girls he might want to date, even though he's kind of uncomfortable talking about that. Um, and he hasn't really thought about himself or his identity much, because why would he? Everyone else seems to kind of have it figured out. He's just kind of going with the flow. But now Rick's gotten a middle school and all of these new doors are opening up. You know, the big wide middle school. Um, we all remember that. And um, so he ends up in the uh, school's Rainbow Spectrum Club where there's kids, um, including this girl, Melissa, who sits in front of Rick and seems to kind of have everything together. And um, Rick wants to really understand himself the way Melissa seems to understand herself. And he really wants um, that feeling of uh, sort of contentment and being seen um, and not just by other people but by himself and that may mean letting go of some of the things um, that he's kind of clung to out of comfort and maybe branching out into the big wide world and making some new friends. So then we have The Best at It by Malik Pancholi. Um, who is an actor. Some of you may be familiar with him. Uh, this one came out in 2019. Um, I love this cover. It's I love the colors. It's so cute. 
Um, so uh, Rahul Kapoor is heading into seventh grade in this small Indiana town. Um, he's super anxious about it, about starting middle school. He's, you know, he's kind of freaking out a little bit. So his grandfather gives him some advice and he means well, but he says, find one thing you're really good at and then become the best at it. Now, a lot of us have heard this advice and a lot of us take it as it's meant to be taken, um, which is, you know, you don't have to be good at everything. You don't have to try to focus on everything at once. Just find something you're good at and then work really hard at that, right? Um, Raul, on the other hand, here's these four words um, and they just it's like a bell getting rung. Um, and he's not really quite sure what his special thing is, but he's convinced that once he figures that out, um, he'll quit getting bullied and he won't have to worry too long about the fact that he stares at his classmate, Justin. And um, with his best friend, Chelsea, he is ready to like get out there and figure out what he's really good at and then become the best at it. Except then, what if he's not? What if he isn't the best at anything? Um, and that's that's something a lot of us struggle with, um, especially a lot of us, you know, overachievers. Uh, not that I personally identify with that or anything, but that's something that a lot of us have to deal with is, is you know, not only figuring out what we enjoy and what we're good at, but like, then what if we're not even like, that great at it. What then? It's a really great story. Um, and it's just, it's just a, it's a bright story. It's great. And I, I think it's also um, kind of an important story for kids uh, these days. So then we have Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World. This is by Ashley Herring Blake, who um, writes a lot of books and writes a lot of um, LGBT friendly books. Um, so a tornado rips through town. Ivy Aberdeen, who's 12 at the time, her house is just destroyed um, and her family of five is displaced. Um, she feels, you know, kind of invisible and ignored after the storm. You know, she, she feels like she doesn't really take priority anywhere. Um, and then what's worse is she had this notebook and it had, you know, all these secret drawings of girls holding hands and that's missing and she can't find it anywhere. Except then her drawings start to reappear in her locker with notes from someone telling her, you know, to open up and to tell someone. Um, Ivy thinks and hopes that this might be like one of her classmates, maybe um, this girl that Ivy has, you know, started to develop a crush on, but she's not sure. And either way, she has to figure out um, and develop the courage and the strength to find and follow her true feelings. Um, you know, this is, I, I know I keep saying this, but this is a really sweet story, you guys. Um, it's adorable. And, um, the tornado backdrop is is a really great, I think, metaphor for how uh, hitting middle school and starting to go through puberty can, uh, in some ways, for some people, just wreck your life. Um, and you're confused about so many things and about, you know, what you've been told and what you feel and what it all means. And... Um, as someone, you know, who, who does uh, identify as a woman and um, who grew up as an extraordinarily awkward girl, the idea of any one of my middle school notebooks going missing, um, even if they didn't, like, contain any, you know, secret cute gay drawings, um, is one of the most horrifying things I can think of, like, to happen to me at 12, that is, like, high-octane nightmare fuel for me, you know, at 32. Um, so I feel like that's something that, you know, a, a lot of kids will be able to identify with. Um, and also, this seems like, you know, a really simple story, and it is, but sometimes you need a simple story with, uh, an ending that is happy and hopeful um, to give you a little boost um, and know that even when everything seems like the end of the world, it's going to be okay. 
So then we have Drum Roll, Please by Lisa Jen Bigelow. This one came out in 2018. Uh, so Melly only joined the school band because her best friend Olivia begged her to. Um, but surprise, she actually like really loves it. She loves playing the drums. And it's the only time she doesn't feel like a mouse, you know, like hidden in the background. Um, so now she and Olivia, they're about to go to this camp, Camp Rockaway um, in the Michigan woods. And they're going to jam. It's going to be great. Um, but the summer starts to bring a lot of big changes for Melly. Uh, her parents split up. Her best friend Olivia just kind of ditches her. And uh, then Melly finds herself, you know, becoming friends with this girl at camp named Adeline. And she finds herself kind of getting a crush on Adeline. And then to top it all off, Melly's like not really sure that drumming is something she's going to be able to be good at. She's not really sure she has what it takes. And um, so again, you know, this is a this is another story that um is is heartwarming in a in a sweet you know kind of like realistic way and the thing that i i love about this story and about a lot of the ones that i've um already told y'all about is that it's a it's a story that you know it's a these are like queer friendly inclusive stories where um in a lot of them the big struggle of the book isn't the fact that these kids are part of the LGBT community. Like that's always an element of it um, as it is, you know, in pretty much any contemporary novel because that's still something that folks are struggling with today. But like, that's not the, the main part of the story because like, yes, we need coming out stories and we need to see, you know, those struggles and we need to experience that whether we personally identify with it or not. But we also need stories um, of queer kids just getting to be kids where their gender identity and their orientations are elements of the story, much like they're elements of those kids, but that's not their whole life. And that's not necessarily even the biggest thing that they're having to deal with at any given time. Um, for Melly, you know, her, her biggest problem is if she's going to be able to really do this thing that she loves to do, um, especially after her whole life has kind of been upended. Um, and so having those stories um, is really important because it not only, you know, shows kids who maybe aren't part of the LGBT community, um, you know, how multifaceted these characters are, um, but it also shows kids who may really, really be struggling with that with themselves that, you know, there's more to life than, than just that. And they've got a whole big, huge life ahead of them. Um, and so there, there, there's a sort of comfort in that that I really appreciate in these stories. So then we have um, Second Dad Summer by Benjamin Class. <laughs> Y'all, this one's so cute. So Jeremiah, he just wants to have like a normal chill summer with his dad. And his dad just moved into an apartment with his new boyfriend, Michael. And it's clear that dad is like really starting to get along with Michael's friends, which would be great. Jeremiah would be super happy for him, except for Jeremiah's kind of starting to feel left out. He's not really into that. He starts to feel kind of invisible. Um, even, you know, when he's right next to his dad. And fortunately, there is Sage, who's this only other kid, like, in this hipster neighborhood. And Sage is quirky. Um, you know, she's fun. And their friendship is cemented at a uh, Pride Festival because Jeremiah finds out that Sage has two moms. Um, much like he might have two dads if he does not put his foot down and get rid of Michael. Um, enter Mr. Keeler, who is this grouchy old smoker who lives downstairs, who has an ongoing feud with Michael. Um, so what I love about this is this is, I mean, I've seen this movie essentially so many times. All of us have where, you know, the kid is going to have to get used to uh, someone new being in uh, one of their parents' lives. And, you know, this is like every step parent story um, that you grew up with. Uh, and you grew up watching, and the fact that Jeremiah, like, 
he, it happens to be another guy. Like that's not the, the main focus. The main, he doesn't want to get rid of Michael because, you know, he's like upset or freaked out that his dad is like dating another dude. He wants to get rid of Michael because like, he does not want this change in his life. And he does not want his dad to abandon him for someone new. And he just, he doesn't like, you know, all of this happening and he just wants to get rid of this dude. Um, and I, I love that. And like I said, it's a, it's a really cute story. Um, and uh, I think it's definitely one that people would have fun reading, um, especially over the summer. It's a, it's a perfect summer story. Uh, then we have Zenobia July by Lisa Bunker. This one came out in 2019. Um, and Lisa Bunker is the one who wrote Felix YZ, if y'all have uh, read that one. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that title right. I apologize. Uh, but anyway, Zenobia July, um, she started a new life in Maine. Um, she used to spend most of her time behind a computer screen, you know, uh, really updating her coding and hacking skills. Um, but now that she's in Maine, she's starting to kind of come out of her shell and, and find her own community and group of friends. Um, people used to tell her that she was a boy. And now that she lives in Maine and it's somewhere new, she can kind of start over and live as a girl the way she always has known she is. Um, but then someone starts anonymously posting a bunch of hateful memes on her school's website, and she knows that she's really the only one who can solve this mystery with all of her coding and hacking skills. Um, but she's still kind of wrestling with, you know, the challenges of a new school and a new family and, you know, coming to grips with being a girl and, like, openly being a girl. And um, it's a really, really sweet kind of touching story. Um, about finding your place and how, you know, many factors may go into that. Um, for Zenobia, it's, you know, quite a lot, but um, it's something that any kid is going to be able to latch onto. Okay, then we have Too Bright to See by Kyle Lukoff. Um, so it's the summer before middle school starts, uh, and Bug, who is 11 years old, um, Bug's best friend Moira has decided like that the two of them need to use uh, the next few months to get ready for middle school. And for Moira, that means, you know, figuring out how to use makeup and getting new outfits and figuring out which boys she likes. And Bug doesn't really want to spend any time trying to do all that. Bug doesn't really, you know, feel like spending all of his extra time trying to understand how to be a girl. Um, besides, there's something like way more important to worry about because there is a ghost that's haunting Bug's eerie old house. Um, and maybe this ghost is not so much haunting the house, but haunting Bug. So Bug has to grapple with being a transgender kid um, going into middle school while also trying to figure out who this ghost is and what they're trying to say. Um, that's a lot to put on an 11-year-old, um, especially over the summer, uh, when you're supposed to be having fun and being free. And, and um, that's sort of the, one of the points, you know, that this, this book is making is for some kids, you know, the summer before middle school, um, you know, it's like, it's a big transitory period. And it is, you know, one that's exciting and it's new. And, you know, for some kids, that means figuring out, you know, how exactly to do all of the things, you know, they're, they're supposed to do that they want to do. Like for Moira, you know, she's a young girl, she's getting into makeup, she's getting into boys. And then for Bug, that means figuring out, you know, not just like a Scooby-Doo ghost mystery, but also figuring out who you actually are and how you want to tell that to the rest of the world and make them understand. Um, it's a, it's a very, very poignant story. Um, it's the, the tagline you can see on the front of the book really like encapsulates it beautifully. It's, um, it says it's hard to be yourself before you know who that is. And that is the honest truth. Um, and I, I think that it's a, it's a mystery story for, you know, not just figuring out this ghost, but also for figuring out bug, and that I think a lot of kids are going to relate to. So then we have uh, Hazel Bly and the Deep Blue Sea by Ashley Herring Blake. Again, you know, another Ashley Herring Blake book. Um, this one comes out in May. So um, Hazel, uh, one of her moms dies, 
And so then her other mother and her little sister, Peach, they kind of travel all over the country. They don't really settle in one place. And then they move to Rose Harbor, Maine. And this small town, it's sort of wild. It's a little weird. It kind of feels almost magical. Um, and then her mom runs into an old childhood friend with this daughter named Lemon, who cannot stop rambling on about the Rosemaid, who is this 150-year-old local mermaid myth. And soon, Hazel finds herself like just as obsessed with the Rosemaid, because what if magic is real? And can grief really change you so much that you aren't even yourself anymore? Um, these are pretty big questions for a middle grade book. But um, they are ones that this book tackles beautifully. Um, and uh, I, can't, I can't really get into more details of this book because like, there's a lot that happens here. Um, but it's a beautiful story that um, I highly recommend y'all get. And then we have Thanks a Lot Universe by Chad Lucas. This one's coming out in May 2021 as well. Um, we have Brian, who has always been like a super anxious kid. And uh, his dad tries to help him stand up for himself. His mom helps. Um, but then he and his brother are placed in foster care and Brian starts having panic attacks. And he doesn't know if things are ever like gonna be normal again, you know? And then we have Ezra, who's always been popular. Um, he's friends with most of the kids on the basketball team, even Brian, who's, you know, pretty quiet and just kind of keeps to himself. Uh, but now some of his friends have been acting kind of weird and Brian seems to be pulling away and Ezra wants to help, but he's worried that if he's too nice to Brian, his friends will realize that he has a crush on Brian. So then Brian and his brother run away and Ezra has no choice anymore. He has to help him. Um, and both of these boys have to decide if they're willing to open up, you know, not just to each other, but to the world. And if they can be brave, they might find the best of themselves and they might find um, comfort and some happiness in each other. Um, this is another one of those that has like some really serious topics side by side with a, a sort of, you know, traditional like, oh no, feelings help kind of story. Um, but it is also beautifully told. Um, and it's about, it's sort of about being weird and being yourself and whatever that may mean and being okay with that. Um, and again, highly relatable, no matter your age, but it's a great story for middle graders. All right, so for my last middle grade book, we have Flight of the Puffin by Anne Braden, who, uh, this one's coming out in May. Um, this is the author of uh, The Benefits of Being an Octopus. Uh, and I love this cover. It is beautiful. Um, so this book is, it's about four different people. You have Libby. She comes from like this long, you know, line of family tradition of bullying. Um, and she wants to be different. But sometimes, you know, that doesn't really work out. Um, now she's suspended again. And then on the opposite side of the country, you have Vincent, who's, you know, kind of weird, kind of a nonconformist trying kind of hard not to get stuffed into lockers at his new school. That's not really working out too well either. Uh, then you have T, who could not take living at home anymore and ran away. And then Jack, who is this really sweet kid um, who's trying really, really hard to keep his small rural school open. Um, and because he's so focused on that, he's kind of lost focus on the people who need him the most. Um, these are four different kids for very different lives. And then one card with a message of hope um, finds and, and reaches each of them and it helps them summon the thing that they need. Um, and it, it makes them realize that they're not alone. Um, again, this is one that I don't wanna explain too much. Um, I don't want to, you know, like get into to any spoilers for it, um, but, it is a, a story that is really, really wonderfully told um, that expresses just beautifully, like we all may be very different and be living very different lives, um, but we all share um, a lot of the same things. We all share a struggle um, and we all can find solidarity in that. We can find comfort in that. Um, and even though you may not be physically close to a person, um, you can still be there for someone, even if all that's connecting you is something as small as a postcard. 
So now for the young adult books. First, we have Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. Um, if I sound ultra excited about this one, it's because I am. <laughs> I love this book. So uh, Yadriel has summoned a ghost. Now he can't get rid of him. Uh, so when his traditional Latinx family has problems accepting his true gender, Yadriel becomes determined to prove himself a real brujo. Um, so with the help of his cousin and his best friend Maritza, he performs the ritual himself, and then he sets out to find the ghost of his murdered cousin and set it free. Uh, the problem is that the ghost he actually summons is Julian Diaz, who is the school's resident bad boy, and he's not about to just go quietly into death. Um, he's determined to figure out what happened, he wants to tie off some loose ends before he leaves, um, and he's generally kind of being a pain. Um, and then, so Yadriel's left with no choice, and he has to help Julian, and then they can both get what they want, right? Except the longer that Yadriel spends with him, the less he wants him to leave. Um, Y'all, is it all? Oh, this is like, this is the, everything about this book is perfect. It is a wonderfully told story. Um, the writing is fantastic. It's um, kind of like loosely enemies to allies, to friends, to lovers story. Um, and uh, anyone who has ever met me knows like that is my jam. But also like it's really funny um, and it's it's really beautiful. And um, there is so much like the atmosphere and the storytelling and just like the culture surrounding it all is so rich and vibrant and great. Like I just I love this book. Um, I can't wait to read it again. Honestly, it's great. Then we have You Should See Me in a Crown by Aaliyah Johnson. Um, so Liz has always believed that she's too black, too poor, too awkward to shine in her small little Midwestern town that it's all rich and fancy and obsessed with prom. Um, but that's okay because, you know, Liz is going to get out of Indiana forever. She is going to attend this super fancy Pennington College. She's going to play in their world famous orchestra and she's going to be a doctor. Uh, and then her financial aid unexpectedly falls through. Um, and all of these plans just kind of start crashing down until she remembers her school scholarship for prom king and queen, because this is a kind of school that has a scholarship for prom king and queen. Um, she's never ever wanted to have anything to do with prom queen. Um, definitely not. And uh, she has a severe fear of the spotlight, but she is willing to do whatever it takes to get into Pennington, get out of Indiana. And the only thing that makes it like halfway bearable is there's this new girl, Mac, who's like super smart, funny, and awesome. And she like, she's just as weird and as much of an outsider as Liz. Um, and the thing is, Mac is also in the running for prom queen. Um, and Liz also starts falling for her. So that's a problem. Um, she's falling for the competition. All of her dreams are on the line. She wants to get out of Indiana. What is gonna happen? Yeah, this story's great. This story's great. Um, the cover is adorable. And it's just, I love the the pacing of this and the way it's written. Um, and it is such a, it's, it feels like a 90s rom-com, but with none of the annoying, awful tropes that you have kind of grown to hate now that you're old enough to know better. Um, so and as someone who is like incredibly familiar with like late 90s, early 2000s rom-coms, because that's what I watched a lot of when I was a kid, um, that is the highest compliment I could give. Uh, so just check this book out, y'all. I promise you won't regret it. Uh, then we have Proud, which is um, a huge anthology. And it's compiled and edited by Juno Dawson, who wrote This Book is Gay and Clean. Um, this is a, a bold, a moving anthology. It's stories and poetry, um, and it's by uh, some of the top LGBTQYA authors, as well as some new talent. Um, well, new when this came out. This came out in 2019. Um, but uh, it, it really kind of brings a, a, each of them brings a really unique element to the overall theme of Pride. Um, and also each story features an illustration by an artist um, who is part of the LGBTQ community. So check this one out. Uh, 
Okay, so now we're moving into the books that are coming out in 2021. So first we have She Drives Me Crazy by Kelly Quinlan. This one came out this month. Um, we just got it in here at MLC and I'm so excited for it. Um, like I'm, I cannot stress enough how happy I am at some of the books that are coming out this year. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, so um, after losing spectacularly to her ex-girlfriend in their first basketball game since their breakup, uh, Scotty Zajac gets into a fender bender with the worst possible person, um, her greatest nemesis, um, who is this beautiful and mean girl named Irene Abraham. Uh, and things only get worse when their nosy do-gooder moms get involved and the girls have to carpool together until Irene's car gets out of the shop. And the more time they spend together, um, the more time they start to kind of grow closer because Scotty wants to get back at her toxic ex. She wants to kind of climb the school's social ladder a little bit at the same time. And she bribes Irene into playing along with her fake dating scheme. Yes, this book has enemies to lovers fake dating. Love it. Love everything about that. Um, also, like, Heads up, y'all, there are a lot of, like, fake dating books on this list because that's just kind of happens to be, like, what's been coming out. Um, and I'm thrilled with that because that trope is hilarious. Sorry, it never stops being funny. It never stops being cute. Love it every second of the day. Here's, you know, number one of a few. Then we have The Ghosts We Keep by Mason Deaver. So when Liam Cooper's older brother, Ethan, is killed in a hit and run, Liam has to face the world without one of his best friends, you know, one of the people he loved the most, um, but also face the fading relationship with his two other best friends. Um, he feels more alone and isolated than ever before. Um, and Liam finds himself sharing uh, time with Ethan's best friend, Marcus. Um, and through Marcus, Liam finds one person that seems to know exactly what they're going through, um, which is good and bad in, in some ways. Um, the, the, the way that this is presented um, is a, a book. It's about a book about grief and about why we live and why we love and why we move on, um, you know, what, what makes us move on and what makes us want to, um, even when some of the worst things in the world could happen to us. Um, it's a beautiful book. Um, Liam uh, uses he, they pronouns. Um, so that's why that kind of changes in the summary there. Um, and that is addressed in the book. But um, Mason Deaver is a phenomenal writer. Um, and this, this is a book that manages to be weirdly uplifting, sort of despite and because of how sad it is, um, you know, as a premise and, and to watch unfold and, and watching Liam kind of go through this grief process. Um, and I, I just, I, I can't say enough good things about this book. And I just, I'll read anything Mason Deaver writes as well. So then we have um, I Think I Love You uh, by Ariana DeSombre. Uh, this one came out in March. Uh, so Emma is a diehard romantic. She loves like all the meat cute Netflix stuff. She has a pet named Lady Catchalit, which is the greatest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Um, and she is dreaming up the gay rom-com of her life for this film festival competition that she and her friends are entering, except they won't listen to anything she has to say. And then there's Sophia, who is pragmatic, um, who's big into boycotts, such as relationships, teen boys, uh, and also all of Emma's like terrible, nauseatingly cute ideas. Uh, Sophia is not here for this starry-eyed romance nonsense. She wants to make a film and uh, with an artistic bent and, and a message. Um, so of course there's drama. And the movie's doomed before they even start shooting, right? until a real-life plot twist unfolds behind the camera and Emma and Sophia start to see each other in a new light. And suddenly, their rivalry starts to feel like a real, actual, real-life rom-com. So then we have Darling by Kayla Ankrum. Um, I will read anything by Kayla Ankrum. Like, everything she touches turns to gold. 
It's amazing. Uh, this book comes out in June. Uh, Kay Ingram wrote uh, The Wicker King and uh, The Weight of the Stars for those of you, like you may already have some of their titles. Um, so Wendy Darling's first night in Chicago, this boy called Peter appears at her window and he is beautiful and magical and she just, she can't stay away. So she agrees to join him for a night out on the town. Um, and Wendy thinks they're going to a party and instead they're running around in the city's underground. Um, she makes a friend, this punk girl named Tinkerbell uh, and all the lost boys that Peter watches over. Um, and she makes some enemies such as uh, Detective Hook, who is terrifying and maybe even Peter himself as some of his secrets start coming out. Um, so Wendy has to find the courage to survive the night and make sure everybody else does too. Um, obviously this is a Peter Pan retelling, uh, but it's a, it's kind of a dark retelling, um, in a, in a way that really just, I'm so excited to read this one. Um, cause it, it seems, um, dark, but in a way that, you know, you're not necessarily expecting. Um, and I, I love like, the, the way this is retold and, and kind of, you know, how it's like this underground sort of punk scene and this weird, um, almost like a fever dream, you know? Um, I'm so excited about this. Um, then we have The Taking of Jake Livingston by Ryan Douglas. This one comes out in July. I have been wanting to read this one for months. Um, first of all, that cover is incredible. Um, this one is, ooh, y'all, this is so cool. So um, Jake Livingston, he's one of the only black kids at St. Clair Prep. Uh, and one of the only others is his brother, uh, his older brother, who's like way more popular than he is. Um, it's kind of hard to fit in already, but making matters worse and more complicated, Jake can see dead people. In fact, he sees dead people around him all the time. Most of them harmless, fine. They're stuck in their own little death loops. Um, they don't really interact with people. And then Jake meets Sawyer, who is a troubled teen who shot and killed six kids at the local high school last year before he killed himself. Um, and now Sawyer is a powerful, vengeful ghost, and he has plans for his afterlife. And those plans include Jake. And then suddenly, everything Jake knows about ghosts and the rules to life and everything kind of go out the window because uh, Sawyer starts haunting him and bodies start turning up in the neighborhood. And uh, high school has kind of turned into a survival game. And that is not a metaphor here. So then we have uh, May the Best Man Win. Um, yes, this is clearly like the summer of rom-coms. Um, and you know what? That's okay. That's great. Uh, this is by Z.R. Allure. This comes out in May. So Jeremy Harkis, who is the cheer captain, student body president, um, and he's a transgender boy. He's not going to let any of that ruin his senior year. Um, and instead of, you know, just kind of going quietly into the night um, with like his outdated school administration and, you know, town bigots, he decides, you know what? No, go big or go home. Um, and he's just going to light it up. And to do that, he's going to challenge his all-star football player ex-boyfriend, Lucas, for title of homecoming king. Uh, Lucas, who, again, football star, he's head of the homecoming committee. He is just trying to find order in his life um, after his older brother's funeral and the loss of his long-term girlfriend, who turned out to be a boy. Um, and then Jeremy threatens to steal his crown. And Lucas is not here for that. Lucas has had enough. Lucas kickstarts a plot to sabotage Jeremy's campaign. Um, but then the rivalry goes a little too far. And the dance is on the verge of being canceled. And um, in order for both of them to get what they want, they have to work together to save homecoming and to face the hurt they're both hiding and um, deal with the lingering feelings that they still have for each other. Okay, now we're going to move into the adult books. So first, Giddy in the Night by Tamsin Muir. Uh, this one came out in 2019. Uh, it recently had uh, its sequel come out, and there is um, the third book in the trilogy will be coming out soon. Um, the Emperor Needs Necromancers. The Ninth Necromancer Needs a Swordsman. Gideon has a sword and some dirty magazines and just really no more time for all of this undead crap. She's ready to abandon her life of servitude and, you know, take her sword and her dirty magazines and flee into the night. Um, 
And also like she doesn't want to be a reanimated corpse. Um, but her childhood nemesis, uh, the only other person her age, um, won't set her free without service. Uh, her childhood nemesis is Harrowhark Nonagesimus, um, the reverend daughter of the ninth house and bone witch extraordinaire. Uh, and Harrow has been summoned into action. The emperor has invited the heirs of each of his loyal houses to a trial of wits and skill. And if Harrow Hark succeeds, she'll become an immortal and an all-powerful servant of the resurrection. But no necromancer can ascend without their cavalier. So without Gideon's sword, Harrow will fail and the ninth house will die. Um, this book is basically lesbian necromancer space opera. Um, and every one of those words is like everything I love and nothing I hate. Y'all, I have not laughed so hard and so long as when I was reading this book. Then we have The Binding by Bridget Collins. Um, this one also came out in 2019. Uh, in this world that Bridget Collins has built, which is kind of like an alternate universe that's um, a little like 19th century England, books are very dangerous, um, and people visit bookbinders to rid themselves of their painful or treacherous memories. And then, when, you know, once their stories are told and bound between the pages of the book, um, the people don't have those memories anymore. Uh, they can't be hurt or haunted by those memories. Um, so you have Emmett Farmer who is a young man who um, he can't really do his chores anymore because he suffered like some kind of mental collapse. Um, and he's sent to the workshop of one of these bookbinders to live and work as her apprentice. Um, and he has to leave behind his home and family. And um, he slowly, you know, starts to regain his health and learns how to bind books. Um, and he's forbidden to enter the locked room where the books are stored. Um, so, you know, he spends a lot of his month like doing the binding and marveling the end pages and, you know, learning how to do all this stuff. Um, but he's really curious about some of the people who come and go. Um, and then this guy arrives, uh, Lucian Darnay, um, and he feels like he has a connection with him, but he doesn't know why. Um, and he really doesn't like him, uh, but he doesn't know why he doesn't like him either. And as he starts to kind of explore this connection and start to figure out, you know, why he's so bothered by this guy, um, his life dramatically starts to change. Uh, then we have The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. This one came out last year in 2020. Uh, T.J. Klune is... Um, a uh, very prolific writer, like he's written a lot of stuff and um, all of it is good. All of it is great even, but this book, um, as you can see on the front cover, uh, Shannon McGuire, who um, if y'all don't know who Shannon McGuire is, uh, she's a, a comic book writer and um, has written a series, the Wayward Children series that begins with Every Heart a Doorway, which is phenomenal. Um, and uh, Shannon's review of this book is, this book is very close to perfect, um, which is high, high praise. Um, and um, I haven't gotten to read this one yet um, because I've literally been saving it as a reward um, to finish with another project of mine. Um, that's how much I want to read this book. Um, and it's it looks fantastic. So um, your main character is Linus Baker. He leaves... he. Your main character is Linus Baker. Um, he's kind of quiet, solitary, uh, and at 40, he lives in this teeny little house. He's got, you know, all of his old records um, and a devious little cat, uh, and he is a caseworker at the department in charge of magical youth, um, and so he spends his days, you know, checking on children in government sanctioned orphanages and making sure that, you know, they're okay and seeing to their well-being, um, and then he is very suddenly summoned by extremely upper management, um, and he's given a curious and highly classified assignment, which is to travel to this island um, and the orphanage there, and um, see uh, six very dangerous children. Um, and he's afraid to do that. He's, he's, he doesn't want to upend his quiet life, um, and he is like genuinely kind of afraid of these kids. Um, but he has to set that aside, 
and he has to uh, determine whether or not these kids are going to be in immense danger, um, including bringing about the end of days, because fun fact, one of these six kids is the Antichrist, um, but uh, the kids aren't the only secret on this island. Um, their caretaker is this very charming guy named Arthur Parnassus, and Arthur will do anything to keep these kids safe. Um, and Arthur and Linus start to grow closer, and secrets start to come out, and uh, Linus has to make a choice to destroy a home or watch the world burn. Um, so uh, I guess if you wanted to sum this up uh, extremely succinctly, it could be... Um, found family gay trolley problem um <laughs> it's i the the little snippets of this book i've read like just have me screaming um because i want to read the rest of it immediately um i've heard nothing but good things about this book um so this is definitely one that you're going to want in your collection then we have This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Multar and Max Gladstone. This one came out in 2019. Um, it's pretty short. It's a, it's a slim book, but it packs a punch. Um, in the ashes of a dying world, an agent of the Commandant finds a letter. It reads, burn before reading. Um, this book takes place in sort of a, a kind of post-apocalyptic sci-fi universe. Um, where two warring factions are essentially battling along a timeline. And they go up and down the threads of time and tweak a little here and change a little there uh, to essentially, like, eventually um, cement uh, a timeline uh, how they want it. And they're also... Um, trying to sabotage, you know, the other side's, uh, uh, like, the things that they're doing, you know, in the timeline. Um, so this, this, this agent of the Commandant finds this letter, and they write back. And uh, these two people um, on these two, you know, rival organizations um, start to uh, right back and forth to each other. And um, it starts kind of as like a taunt. It's, it's you know, um, the, at first they're like these teasing notes, you know, that's essentially like, you know, ha ha, got here before you could. Or, you know, yeah, here you go. Now I ruined your thing. Um, and then they start to write more. And those little taunts kind of evolve um, into a, uh, not just a connection, um, but a very, very deep and sort of romantic connection. Um, and it could change the past and it could change the future. And um, the problem is that the discovery of these letters written back and forth um, would immediately result in their death because there's still a war going on. Um, it's essentially like two spies who fall in love via letter and maybe change the tide of an entire um, time travel war. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really great. Check it out. Trust me. Um, so then we have Lone Stars by Justin Diebler. This came out in February. Um, Julian Warner, he is finally a dad, uh, but he's now wrestling with the question that his husband posed to him, which is, what are you going to tell our son about the people you came from now that they're gone? Um, and to find this answer, Julian essentially has to go, you know, back in time. Um, and that's where this story uh, kind of takes place. It takes, it spans four generations um, of his family and shows kind of, you know, how he got to where he is and, and, like how all of this has has happened um so as a reader you go back to you know like the eisenhower administration um and like immigration border raids uh and then there is um a love letter uh affair you know during the vietnam war and there are crumbling marriages and um there's you know the whole queer migration from cambridge to new york and then like 
all the way up to Obama's second term and how that, you know, kind of polarized the entire nation even more than it already was. Um, and the thing is, though, is that going back these generations and seeing all of these stories um, and bringing all of that out into the light really shows um, how connected we all are and all of the things that we share um, and how we can and should empathize with one another, even though we seem so very different on the surface. Then we have Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. This one also came out in February. Um, I, <laughs> y'all, this book is great. So um, you have Grace, who is a straight A, worked through the summer, uh, overachiever. Um, you know, she puts her nose to the grindstone. She is not the kind of person who goes to Vegas and gets drunk and then gets married to a woman whose name she doesn't even know, except for that's kind of what she has done. Um, <laughs> This, this one moment of, of departure from, you know, her very strictly planned, hardworking life that has been kind of dictated by her stern ex-military dad um, makes her wonder why she doesn't feel more fulfilled um, from the life she's been leading. You know, she's got her PhD. That's why she went to Vegas in the first place, because she was having, you know, like a girl's weekend um, to celebrate getting her PhD. Um, she's, you know, kind of struggling under uh, the weight of her father's expectations and the job market being what it is and the feeling of burnout, you know, as a 28-year-old a um, PhD student, um, which is, is very relatable. Um, so under all of this pressure, she takes off. And um, she takes off with her new Vegas wife, um, who is beautiful and creative and wonderful. Um, and she starts to really fall in love with her. Um, and then reality comes crashing in, as it is wont to do. And Grace has to confront what she's been running from, um, which, you know, the fear of, of failure, the fear of being adrift, um, the fear of, of not having your life together and what that means for you and the people around you, the fear of, you know, disappointing your family and not being who they wanted you to be. Um, those are very familiar human fears and, um, adulthood is hard and it's messy. And this is a book that explores that, um, while also giving us this adorable, beautiful love story. Um, so in conclusion, go read Honey Girl right now. Next, we have Winter's Orbit by Evrina Maxwell. Um, this also came out in February. Uh, and this is another, um, kind of action sci-fi story. Um, so while the Iskat Empire has long dominated the system through treaties and political alliances, several planets, including Thea, have begun to chafe under Iskat's rule. When tragedy befalls Imperial Prince Tam, his Thean widower, Janan, don't know if that's how you pronounce that, sorry in advance, um, is rushed into an arranged marriage with Tam's cousin, the disreputable Kim, in a bid to keep the rising hostilities between the two worlds under control. But when it comes to light that Prince Tam's death may not have been an accident and that Janin himself may be a suspect, the unlikely pair must overcome their misgivings and learn to trust one another as they navigate the perils of the Iskat court, try to solve a murder, and prevent an interplanetary war, all while dealing with their growing feelings for each other. So we have a sci-fi action murder mystery featuring uh, a strangers slash enemies to lovers arranged marriage story. Um, that sounds amazing. I love that so many of the um, more recent uh, like LGBT stories that have come out um, are like genre stories. I, I love that because again, you know, I was talking about in the, the picture book section, how we need, um, we need stories where, um, you know, yes, like we need coming out stories and we need to, um, explore those parts of queer life, but like, that's not the only experience. And it's also extremely refreshing and beneficial to have stories 
that feature queer characters um, just, you know, in space or on dragons or solving mysteries or all of those things, depending on the genre and how many genres are overlapping. Um, so I, I really love that that um, has, is featuring a lot in these. Um, and, and I think that genre fiction has always kind of lended itself um, to queer stories, but I I love the the convergence that's becoming more popular, at least in my um, experience and exploration. So finally, we have Casey McQuiston's One Last Stop. Um, this one's coming out in June. Uh, if you recognize the name Casey McQuiston, it is because um, uh, Casey is also the author of Red, White, and Royal Blue, which is an extremely popular book, um, as it should be, because it's delightful. If you haven't read that one and don't have that one in your collection either, go get it immediately. So this one, your main character is uh, August, 23 years old. Um, she's moving to New York City, and moving to New York City is supposed to kind of prove um, the point that she has come to. Um, which are that things like magic and love stories and, you know, movie romances and all that stuff, that's not real. And the only way to go through life uh, is to go through life alone. Um, that's the way you are going to make it. That's the way you're not going to get hurt. Uh, and there's no chance of uh, her subway commute being anything more than, you know, boring um, at best and annoying at worst, uh, except for then there's this absolutely gorgeous girl on the train. Uh, her name is Jane. She is charming and mysterious and weird and cool, and August is just so taken with her. Um, you know, Jane, she's kind of rough around the edges, but she's really sweet. Um, she shows up in her leather jacket to save August Day when she needs it the most. And um, so August, you know, obviously kind of gets a little subway crush. And that's like the best part of her day. Um, except for fairly soon, she realizes that Jane doesn't just look like an old school punk. She is um, literally displaced in time uh, from the 70s. And August is going to have to use everything she tried to leave in her own past to help Jane get where she needs to be. Um, so we have a time-traveling lesbian love story between, you know, a 70s punk and uh, a modern-day early 20-something who uh, thinks that the, the best way to make it in life is to be alone. And obviously, that's not going to go according to plan. It sounds adorable. Um, and I can't wait to read it. The world needs more weird genre rom-coms. All right, now we're gonna move into nonfiction books. All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. Um, this one came out in 2020. It's a series of personal essays. Um, George M. Johnson is a journalist and an activist. And in these essays, um, he explores his childhood and adolescence and then his college years um, in Jersey and Virginia. And um, it's a very, very frank memoir. Um, it's it's um, it's beautifully written, but it's also very direct about what it deals with. Um, it's a young adult memoir and it, it really brings together um, all of the different facets of what it's like to be a black queer teen boy. Um, I, I don't remember his exact words, but it was something along the lines of, you know, that his experiences aren't necessarily like an anomaly. It happens all the time. Um, you know, the good and the bad, this stuff happens to kids all the time. But when it, in particular, when it comes to the bad stuff in this book, you know, they're not too young to experience this, this trauma. So they are definitely not too young to read about it and understand it and empathize with it. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, then we have No Way, They Were Gay, Hidden Lives and Secret Loves by Lee Wynn. Um, this is coming out this month in April. Um, I love the concept of this book and I'm super excited to read it. Um, 
uh, it, the, the summary is, you know, history sounds really official and like it's all fact, like that's definitely what happened. Um, but as we all somewhat know, that's not necessarily true. Um, like I said before, you know, they've said history is, is written by the victors and history is crafted by the people who recorded it. And that means that LGBT people have often been left out of history. Um, you know, queer people of all orientations and genders, um, people who, you know, lived outside of these boundaries, um, whether historians didn't recognize what they were seeing or whether they wanted to, you know, deliberately hide those aspects of people from the world. Um, there is a, a serious lack of um, clarity in a lot of LGBT history. And um, so this book kind of explores that. And, um, explores um, some of the, the queer side of history with some famous people that you know you may have known about and you may not have known about from William Shakespeare and the Pharaoh Hatshepsut to Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, then we have Glitter Up the Dark, How Pop Music Broke the Binary by Sasha Geffen. This came out in 2020. Um, and I love the summary for this. Uh, it's, you know, why has music so often served as an accomplice to transcendent expressions of gender? Why did the query, is he musical, become code in the 20th century for, is he gay? Why is music so inherently queer? I love that too. Like, I'm just imagining people going, you know, is he, you know, musical? <laughs> um, but for Sasha Geffen, uh, the answer lies in part in music's intrinsic quality of subliminal expression, which allows rigid gender roles to fall away uh, in an ambiguous exchange between performer and listener, um, which is a really, you know, elaborate way of saying um, part of the reason why music is so inherently queer is because um, it is a medium in which uh, there are a lot of layers and um, there is a lot of fluidity and uh, regardless of the musical genre or the artist or, or the listener, there is um, a sort of intimacy and um, interplay and metaphor that happens in music. Um, and often, especially like, you know, pop music itself um, that can kind of blur some of those lines. Um, and this book kind of, you know, explores um, the history of uh, gender fluidity in pop music from the early 20th century to now. Now we're gonna move on to um, the graphic novels. So um, these are three graphic novel series. There's Heartstopper by Alice Oseman. And um, Alice Oseman's a very prolific author and writes a lot of um, queer YA lit, um, but uh, Heartstopper is a very popular graphic novel series right now. Then we have Check, Please by Ngozi Ukazu. Um, if you have not read Check, Please, you need to. It started as a webcomic, um, and I think it's still available as a webcomic, but it's being, um, it's being published as a graphic novel, and it is adorable. Um, it's extremely adorable. Um, and then there is uh, Heavy Vinyl, which um, is basically um, a girl version of Fight Club fighting the patriarchy. <laughs> it's great. It's super cool. Um, so these are three like either new or relatively new um, and popular series that you should look into for getting for your libraries. Uh, then we have some standalone graphic novels. There's Bingo Love, um, which uh, is adorable and shows, um, first it shows a relationship that spans over you know, uh, uh, several decades, um, but it, it features older uh, queer people, which is something that we often don't see and we definitely need to see more of. Then there's Taproot, which is a story about a gardener and a ghost. Um, it is extremely sweet and extremely cute. Um, can't recommend that one enough. Uh, Y'all know me, I love ghost stories, so obviously I was going to be into this, but seriously, like, it is, it is all the warm fuzzies. Um, and then there's Snapdragon, um, which uh, features a trans character and an old witch and um, a very, very cute little dog, and it's super fun. 
Um, then we have some more nonfiction. This is actually a whole series. As you can see, it's, you know, the quick and easy guide. Um, the first two on the left are the ones um, that I was like really prompted to put in this presentation, but I also wanted to include the two on the right, A, because the whole series goes really well together, and B, because um, those are two subjects, you know, that, that need to be explored more and that um, are often uh, kind of left out when discussing like queer literature because it's or when really discussing like any kind of um diverse inclusive collection development attempts because like people sort of sometimes seem to be under the impression that like you can't have too many um marginalized identities in one uh area or even one piece of fiction because that's somehow not realistic and that's fundamentally untrue um so yeah, this uh, the quick and easy guide series. There's the quick and easy guide to they them pronouns. Um, there's the quick and easy guide to queer and trans identities. Uh, the quick and easy guide to sex and disability, and then the quick and easy guide to consent. Uh, then we have some more nonfiction. There's how to they them, <laughs> uh, a visual guide to non-binary pronouns and the world of gender fluidity by Stuart Getty. Um, there's How to Be Ace, a memoir of growing up asexual uh, by Rebecca Burgess. Then there's Our Work is Everywhere. It's an illustrated oral guide to queer and trans resistance. Um, it's also like a pretty short book. Um, it's a very easy read, but the illustrations are outstanding. Uh, then we have another memoir, Gender Queer. Um, it came out, I believe, a couple years ago. Um, and it's uh, also a really, really excellent memoir and a great way um, to uh, look into what it's like um, to kind of wrestle with the topic of gender and identity and, and what that means to you um, from a really like well-written perspective. Now some program ideas. I'm gonna keep these uh, relatively short, but the, the cool thing about these particular ideas is that um, most of them, are like pretty adaptable to like all ages. Um, I mean, like all of them are pretty much adaptable to all ages except for like your pre-K and toddler group. Um, but for your pre-K and toddler groups, like that would be a, a time, you know, where you tie in maybe some of those picture books that I mentioned above, um, or, you know, like there there are more than a few books that kind of use the, the rainbow and color like uh, as a metaphor for identity, um, that I think would be a good way, you know, that, that your really, really little kids and your early readers can, you know, kind of understand. Um, so the rest of these program ideas can pretty much be adaptable to any group from, you know, your K to six kids to all the way to your seniors. Um, so first we have badges and pins. This is an easy little program, um, and it's fun and they can get as simple or as creative as they want. Um, they can do handmade ones, um, like, you know, they could draw them themselves, or, um, if you can see the picture on the top right, they can cut out, you know, like, pictures, um, and words and maybe make them that way. Um, you could also do this, like, um, you could share with them, like, Canva tutorials, or maybe, like, have a program where you guys are, like, teaching them how to use Canva, um, and then you could have, you know, like a design session where you all make your own pins together like that. Um, and then if you don't have a button maker, um, you can check with the library commission. I know we have like two button makers that we are um, more than willing to lend out to libraries um, in order for them to have a program like this. Or you can invest in one of your own. Um, they're really not super expensive. Um, and, um, you know, they're, to me, they're a good investment because you can do lots of different programs with buttons. Then um, you can make bracelets. Like there are lots of different kinds of bracelets you can make, um, but I really liked this design here. Um, you can use a variety of colors or you can do, you know, like you could do the whole rainbow if you wanted to, you know, make just like a, a general like pride themed bracelet um, or, you know, if you've got um, some patrons that want to use specific colors, like, you know, if they want a, a, like, bisexual pride bracelet, it could be, you know, like, pink and purple and blue, or if they want, um, like, a, an aromantic pride bracelet, you know, it could be, 
I think those are, are like gray, white, black, lavender, and green, I believe. Um, but the, my point is, um, you can do a, a ton of different, you know, color schemes with this in a way that, you know, really fits with whatever your patron wants to do. Or you can do, you know, a, a like all rainbow um, sort of pride or, or ally bracelet. Um, also, this one makes like a really great take and make project because you can print the instructions and just, you know, send out the materials and they're good to go. Um, and I linked you to um, the tutorial for this particular bracelet there at the bottom. Um, then we have um, some speaker opportunities. So to me, this would be like a really great program to do and you could do it virtually or, you know, you could do it in person. Um, and there's a few different things you can do. You could do like a Q&A with your teens plus some queer community leaders um, or people from like local queer organizations. Um, you know, kind of just like, what are some things that they want to know? Um, whether it's, you know, about the community itself or just, you know, about experiences, like that's a great way um, to create um, a comfortable space for teens to be able to ask their questions and um, uh, to get answers and advice um, from members of the queer community that are older than them and that are like involved in the community um, and that, you know, they can kind of see in like a mentor role. Um, you can also do some maybe like some of those like similar leaders or organizations um, could have someone come and talk to like parents and grandparents, and guardians or teachers and, and people who like, just like allies in general, as especially caregiver roles um, that want to learn more about the LGBTQ community, um, but really don't know where to start. And they maybe feel a bit adrift and they are kind of intimidated to, you know, look into books and start like reading on the big wide internet because there's so much information out there. Um, and, you know, maybe people who they want to understand, um, but they don't really know how to go about it themselves. Um, that I think is a, a good, like kind of low stakes, non-intimidating way um, for people who are in caregiver positions or authority positions um, to understand more about the community in a way that will benefit them and benefit, um, you know, the kids in their care and who, you know, just kind of want to learn more and don't really know where to start. Um, and you could also do um, LGBTQ history panels and discussions. Um, this is, uh, I think, a great program idea because, you know, I talked earlier about the importance of, of history and knowing that like not only knowing LGBT history, but knowing um, that there is a history there to be found that, you know, queer people have existed since like the beginning of time. And um, we don't often know that people sort of act like it's a new phenomenon and it's not like queer people have always been here. And it's just that um, a lot of history um, has been shaped to make their narratives um, sort of disappear. And so this would be a, a good like sort of neutral and educational way um, to teach some people some things that they may not have known before. And then just really quickly, some display ideas. Um, there are tons of different, you know, display things you can do, um, but I just kind of included some elements and themes here that you can tie in. Um, some really like easy and cheap um, or, you know, DIY decorations like uh, our pennant banners or pride flags or streamers and stuff like that. Like that, those are some um, decorations that like, no matter how big or small the area um, in which you're working, you can adapt and, um, you know, put those kind of different decorations up. Make sure that you include audiobooks, DVDs, graphic novels, and large type books in your displays whenever you can, like whenever you have those available. Um, you can create um, your own, like the library's like pride theme playlist on YouTube, um, and you could create a QR code to link people to it. 
if you have, um, if your library has a Spotify account, you can create the playlist there and you can make it like a collaborative playlist so that um, patrons who want to collaborate with you can add songs to that playlist. Um, you can also create a digital display. And instead of like just having, um, you know, books that are in the collection or eBooks that are in, in the collection, you can include um, LGBT history videos. You can include music videos from famous queer musicians. You can have, you know, a little slideshow that's like an art gallery featuring queer artists. Um, you can grab really interesting articles and essays and stuff from around the internet. Like there's a ton of stuff that you could do to create um, a really comprehensive, interesting uh, digital display for um, like LGBT history and culture. Um, and if you need any more ideas, you know, on this kind of stuff um, or tips on where to find some of the stuff that I've mentioned here, please feel free to contact me because, um, you know, I've got a ton of ideas, but this webinar is already running a little long. So um, I wanted to, you know, keep it short. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you uh, for watching this far. And if you have any questions or you need any help, um, or you just, you know, want to yell at me because you thought I forgot a super important book on here that you think I should have included, um, you can email me at kmartin-gant at mlc.lib.ms.us, or you can call me at 601-432-4057. Um, I will say that I am infinitely more likely to answer an email than a phone call just because Usually when I'm recording one of these, I put my phone on mute and then sometimes I forget to unmute it. Um, so yeah, just shoot me an email um, if you need anything and I will be happy to help. Thanks.